there's been a very long tradition of the Christian church blaming the Jews. And the basis for this can be seen in the New Testament accounts of the trial of Jesus. The Romans are the unwilling participants who never want to see this, who would stop it if they could. This is completely spurious history. Scholars just discovered that Pontius Pilate revealed some shocking secrets about Jesus before he died, and it contradicts everything we know about the Son of God. The Roman official who we all know ordered Jesus' crucifixion kept some secrets about Jesus, and he didn't reveal them until the day he died. What did he reveal about Jesus? Could they have been involved in some scandal together? Join us as we explore what Pontius Pilate revealed about Jesus before his passing. Moments before Christ was nailed to the cross where his life was given up, the high priest broke some silence about Jesus and revealed some terrifying knowledge about him. What exactly did he say and why is it terrific? Let us travel back to ancient Jerusalem as we uncover a revelation so profound. Despite being a good man, and despite having performed many miracles while he was on earth, Jesus Christ was accused by the Jewish council, and they ensured that he died a painful death on the cross, declaring unashamedly that his blood is on them and their children. Pontius Pilate was the fifth governor of the Roman province of Judea, serving under Emperor Tiberius from 2627 to 3637 AD. He is known best for being the official who presided over the trial of Jesus and ultimately ordered his crucifixion. Pilate's importance in Christianity is underscored by his prominent place in both the Apostles and Nicene creeds. Because the Gospels portray Pilate as reluctant to execute Jesus, the Ethiopian church believes that Pilate became a Christian and venerates him as both a martyr and a saint, a belief which is historically shared by the Coptic Church with a feast day on 19 or the 25th of June, respectively. Right before Pilate gave the order for Jesus to be executed, he was arrested and taken to Caiaphas, the high priest who was behind Christ's rigged trial. The teachers of the law and the elders had assembled in Sanhedrin, while one of his disciples, Peter, followed at a distance. The Sanhedrin was the highest ruling council of the Jews. There were 70 members, mostly made up of Sadducees, Pharisees, and priests, together with the leader who was the high priest. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they could not find any. Finally, two people came forward and they accused him of threatening to destroy the temple. Jesus had once said he would destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days, and this could have been a distortion of Jesus' teaching about the resurrection when he said his body, which refers to the temple, would be raised in three days. Eventually, Caiaphas demanded of Jesus, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus answered him, So you say, but I tell all of you, from this time on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right side of the Almighty and coming on the clouds of heaven. Caiaphas declared, This was blasphemy. Blasphemy is known to be a religious offense when a person says or does something regarded as being disrespectful to God. In the eyes of the Jewish leaders, when Jesus claimed to be God's son, he was insulting God. And so the guilty verdict was passed. Then they spat in Jesus' face and beat him. There were quite a number of reasons why the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus to be put to death. Firstly, they said he challenged their authority by calling them hypocrites. He also mixed with sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors, a category of people the Jewish leaders regarded as unclean. He also disobeyed their law concerning the Sabbath observance. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. They also accused him of making claims about himself that the Jewish leaders could not accept. Claims like he was the Son of God and the promised Savior. Now that the Jewish leaders have found Jesus guilty of a crime deserving the death sentence, they have to take him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Apparently, it turns out the Sanhedrin did not have authorization to carry out the death penalty at the time, and they needed the assent of the Roman governor to bring Jesus to execution. They accused him, saying, We have found this man corrupting our people, forbidding them to pay taxes to Caesar and saying he is Christ, a king. Those were the two charges brought against Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus never forbade the people to pay Roman taxes. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You are the one saying it. Jesus answered simply that the words were Pilate's, not his own. He did not answer the question as such, because there was no point in entering into debate. Like the members of the Sanhedrin, Pilate was not interested in the truth that Jesus preached. 
So Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds that he finds no guilt in Jesus, hence there's no reason to crucify him. In the eyes of the Roman authority, Jesus had no real charge to answer. Pilate effectively declared him innocent. Pilate asked whether Jesus was a Galilean, but realizing that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him on to Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who was also the ruler of Galilee between 4 BC to 39 AD. Herod was in Jerusalem in those days, but he had no power in Jerusalem, even though his father and his brother Archelaus had once ruled there. He would probably have owned property in Jerusalem. It was hardly likely that he was in Jerusalem for religious purposes. He was not renowned for his piety. However, his presence may have been helpful to his reputation. Many Galileans would have known of it and possibly approved. The Bible records that when King Herod saw Jesus, he was very pleased because he had been wanting to see him for a long time. Herod had heard about him and was hoping to see him work some miracles, so he spoke to him, but he did not answer him at all. The high priests and scribes persisted in accusing him vehemently. The whole interlude was strange. Herod certainly knew about Jesus and all he has been doing in Galilee. Since he was highly sensitive about his own security, he had a very efficient intelligence staff at work in his kingdom. Herod had seen John the Baptist as a threat when John had explicitly accused him of marrying Herodias. Though Herod was not morally sensitive, he certainly recognized that many Galileans opposed his marriage, not just for moral, but also for political reasons. Yet he had never moved to arrest Jesus, even though Pharisees told Jesus that he wanted to kill him, and he certainly had no religious interest in Jesus. He was simply curious. Given Herod's lack of genuine interest, Jesus did not bother to answer his questions. Herod, with his officers humiliated and mocked him and putting a grand robe around him, sent him back to Pilate. Jesus had treated Herod with disdain. Herod treated Jesus with contempt. In his concern not to lose face before a criminal who ignored him, he set about dishonoring Jesus, having his soldiers mock his supposed regal claims by clothing him in one of his own grand robes and sending him back publicly to Pilate. The Bible also recorded that Herod and Pilate were never friends, but they became friends with each other that day. Pilate summoned the high priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as someone who has been perverting the people. You have seen how I have examined him in your presence and found in him no proof of the things you have been accusing him of. Nor has Herod who sent him back to us. Nothing worthy of death has been committed by him. I shall accordingly punish him and set him free. Having declared Jesus innocent, why then did Pilate proceed to have Jesus punished? Now, it is the custom in Rome that the governor frees a prisoner chosen by the people during the Passover. So Pilate asked the people who he should set free between the well-known terrorist named Jesus Barabbas and Jesus Christ, the Messiah, for he knew that Jesus had been brought to him by the people out of envy. He said, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? The Gospel of Matthew records that while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message, warning him not to have anything to do with the innocent man, Jesus. For she said she suffered a great deal in her dream because of him. Pilate's decision did not in fact satisfy the chief priests or elders. They wanted more than simply to regain their honor. They wanted Jesus dead. Their desire for the blood of Jesus would have explained why they had gathered a smallish crowd of other people. A distracting element was introduced into the trial, which was the plea of the leaders and the additional crowd for the release of Barabbas. Ironically, he was under sentence for the same alleged crime of Jesus, insurrection, as well as for the crime of murder, though in his case the crimes were real. Why, however, would Pilate be likely to release a man whom he had previously found guilty? And why did the chief priests and elders cry out for his release? Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate asked them the question again, but they shouted out, Crucify! Crucify him! This was the first time in any of the trials that crucifixion had been explicitly mentioned. A third time he said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? I found nothing in him deserving of death, so I shall punish him and set him free. This was a reference to the innocence of Jesus. It was an important element of his message but they insisted more loudly, demanding that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. 
Pontius Pilate, left with no other option, then decreed that their demand be granted. He took some water, washed his hands in front of them to show he has nothing to do in his death. He released the man imprisoned for rioting and murder, Barabbas as they requested, and handed Jesus over to them to their pleasure. Was Jesus guilty of those crimes? As we mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ was accused of committing some crimes by the Jewish council. Did he really break those laws, and why did he break them? On a Sabbath, when Jesus went into the synagogue, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse him, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? In Mark and Luke, it is Jesus who asks whether it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath, by way of reply in the Gospel of Matthew appealing to the human sentiment of his hearers. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. According to Mark's account, the Pharisees then went out and began to plot with the Herodians, their natural enemies, how they might kill Jesus. The Gospels record several occasions when Jesus performed a healing on the Sabbath day. In most of those instances, the healing was followed by a confrontation with the religious leaders. In another passage, Luke 4, 38-41, Jesus heals after teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath, but no confrontation is recorded as the miracle was performed in a private home. Jesus knew the Pharisees' rules regarding the Sabbath, so why did he choose to heal on that day? Jesus was not violating the law of God when he healed on the Sabbath. He was surely acting against the interpretation of the Pharisees about the law and against their particular rules. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The basic reason that Jesus healed on the Sabbath was that people needed his help. Jesus healed on the Sabbath in order to reveal the hypocrisy of the Pharisees' religion. In three passages where Jesus' healing led to a confrontation, Jesus references how the Jews worked on the Sabbath by taking care of their animals, and that work was sanctioned by the Pharisees. In an agrarian society, animal care was a major part of a normal day, Jesus points out their willingness to work on the Sabbath to help an animal. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Luke 13, 15. And he rightly calls out their hypocrisy for denying aid to a daughter of Abraham in verse 16. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he was also challenging the religious leaders with the question of doing good or evil on the Sabbath, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. Mark 3, 4. The leaders remained silent and refused to answer. His healing gave them the answer. Doing good and saving life is lawful, even on the Sabbath. Using the Sabbath rule to do evil or to kill is an ungodly perversion of the law. Another reason Jesus healed on the Sabbath was to remind people of why God instituted the Sabbath day of rest. The Sabbath was meant to benefit people as much as to glorify God. Mark 2.27 says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath helped people recuperate after a week of work and redirect their focus from the daily routine to God. Jesus' healing on the Sabbath was therefore very much compatible with God's purpose for the Sabbath. Their stubbornness is a good reminder for us of our need to examine our beliefs and ensure they are biblical and in line with the Word of God. Jesus was also accused of claiming he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. What does he mean by saying this statement? This sounds like a very serious accusation. If Jesus threatened to destroy the sacred temple, he would be committing blasphemy, which deserves the death penalty. He would also be outed as a fraud. Did Jesus really say this, or was it a lie? Well, he said it. In the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples and others many times that he would die and rise from the dead. Jesus knew what his mission was. His disciples thought he was the promised Messiah who would reign on King David's throne in Jerusalem forever. They were just waiting for Jesus to overthrow the Romans and take back the throne. But they didn't totally understand. Jesus was the promised Messiah. And he would reign on a throne in a kingdom forever. 
but he would earn his throne by dying, not by killing anyone. What is the significance of Jesus' eating with sinners? Soon after calling Matthew to follow him, Jesus ate a meal with many tax collectors and sinners in Matthew's house. Matthew had been a tax collector, and these sinners were his friends and acquaintances who were now spending time with Jesus. Matthew wanted to introduce people in his social circle to Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees who despised tax collectors complained, but Jesus' actions in spending time with sinners were in perfect accordance with his mission to seek and to save the lost. In Jesus' day, rabbis and other spiritual leaders enjoyed widespread respect and were held in high esteem in Jewish society. Almost everyone looked up to the Pharisees. They were strict adherents to the law. They were the guardians of tradition, and they were the exemplars of piety. In their vaulted position, they avoided those whom they deemed sinners, those who did not follow their system of rules. Pharisees and the other religious class of Jesus' day would definitely not have socialized with tax collectors who were infamous for embezzlement and their cooperation with the hated Romans. Jesus chose to eat with sinners because they needed to know that repentance and forgiveness were available. As Jesus' ministry grew, so did his popularity among the social outcasts of society. Once Matthew was part of his inner circle, Jesus naturally had more contact with the pariahs of his society. Spending time with the tax collectors and sinners was only natural, since he had not come to call the righteous but sinners, as Mark 2.17 says. If Jesus was to reach the lost, he must have some contact with them. Sitting at Matthew's feast, Jesus broke societal taboos and condemned the Pharisees' legalistic system of attaining righteousness. The fact that Jesus ate with sinners shows that he looked beyond culture to people's hearts. Whereas the Pharisees disregarded people because of their past behavior, Jesus saw their spiritual need. Throughout his ministry, he reached out to those who needed him. He conversed with a despised Samaritan woman at a well. This surprised even his disciples. He forgives an immoral woman in Luke chapter 7, and he helps a Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7. He touches a leper in Luke chapter 5, and he enters Zacchaeus' house and dines with him in Luke chapter 19. Again and again, Jesus touched the untouchable and loved the unlovely. Jesus came to save sinners. Tradition, cultural bans, and the frowns of a few do not matter when a soul's eternal destiny is on the line. John 3.17 says, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Jesus had compassion and sought to meet the needs of those around Him. In sharing the Word of God, Jesus ate with sinners and spent time with them. Seeing all of this, sinners were no doubt inspired to know Him better. They recognized Jesus as a righteous man, a man of God. The miracles he performed bore witness to that, and they saw his compassion and sincerity. Jesus didn't let social status or cultural norms dictate his relationships with people. As the good shepherd, he sought the lost sheep wherever they had strayed. When Matthew hosted the dinner party, Jesus accepted the invitation. It was a wonderful opportunity to share the good news of the kingdom with those who most needed to hear. He was criticized for his actions by the self-righteous legalists of his day, but he was not discouraged by their criticism. Unlike the Pharisees, Jesus didn't require people to change before coming to him. He sought them out, met them where they were, and extended grace to them in their circumstances. Again, in the story of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus teaches love and forgiveness. Jesus was teaching in the temple after coming from the Mount of Olives. A group of scribes and Pharisees confronts Jesus, interrupting his teaching. They bring in a woman, accusing her of committing adultery, claiming she was caught in the very act. They tell Jesus that the punishment for someone like her should be stoning, as it is in the Mosaic Law. When the woman's accusers continued their challenge, instead of stepping into their legalistic snare, Jesus silently stooped down and began tracing his finger in the sand. He states that the one who is without sin is the one who should cast the first stone at her. The accusers and congregants depart, realizing not one of them is without sin either, leaving Jesus alone with the woman. Jesus asks the woman if anyone has condemned her, and she answers no. Jesus says that he too does not condemn her and tells her to go and sin no more. The scribes and Pharisees were hoping to catch Jesus in a trap. In cases of adultery, Jewish law called for stoning, as found in Deuteronomy 
22-22. If Jesus recommended that the woman be released, he could be accused of breaking the law or of treating the law of Moses nonchalantly. On the other hand, if Jesus recommended stoning the woman, he would be breaking Roman law, bringing on the wrath of the government and giving the Jewish leaders occasion to accuse him. The Jewish leaders cared nothing for true justice, evidenced by the fact they only brought the adulterous woman. Justice would naturally demand that the adulterous man face the same treatment. Jesus' response flawlessly preserved both Roman and Jewish law while uncovering the evil intentions in the hearts of the woman's accusers. Jesus reassured her with words of grace and truth. Then neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. With her guilt and shame addressed, Jesus now offered her a new life. Perhaps the most striking aspect of the story of the woman caught in adultery is how it illustrates the harmony of justice and mercy in Christ's salvation. God pronounces judgment on sin, but provides a way to escape condemnation. Jesus does not encourage the sin, but he loves the sinner. The Lord silences the critics of this world while healing hearts that are burdened with guilt and shame. God never treats sin casually, but calls sinners to turn away from their old, corrupt way of life. Despite all the accusations laid against him, he chose to die in the most painful way anyone ever has. The high priest, Pontius Pilate, played a pivotal role in the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial passing that Christianity was built upon. What do you think about this revelation? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below.